hello. That was fun. I just want to do that for half an hour. Um, awesome. Uh, that's my slide. Um, and that's my cursor. I'll just kind of ignore that. There we go. Um, so yeah, I always do this because it's fun and it makes me feel clever. Um, put your hands up if you've heard of Thomas Was Alone. Boom. Awesome. <laughs> put your hand up if you haven't. Okay, cool. Um, rectangles, feelings, jumping. Okay? Um, I'm not going to show a trailer because, frankly, I'm bored of this game. Um, <laughs> oh, I need to laugh less violently. Um, so this is a talk about Thomas Was Alone, but actually it's not. Um, you've all been tricked. Um, I'm really bored of talking about Thomas Was Alone. Um, basically, I've done a lot of talks about the... Oh, can't walk away either. A lot of talks about the, the history of the production, the two years, working, doing another job, struggling, losing friends, working hard, finally you know, bringing out the game, a year of out there, then making money, rags to riches stuff. Um, and I'm bored. I'm bored of saying that, and I'm a little bit bored of hearing that story. It's, uh, it's cool the first time you tell it, but it gets a bit dull. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about everything but Thomas Was Alone. Um, I think there's a lot of reasons Thomas Was Alone did well that weren't about how clever I am um, or how clever the people I work with are. Um, I think there's a lot of changes that have happened to the way games are made, about how specifically indie games are made, which help us and that we can all actually benefit from. And I don't hear a lot of the points I'm going to make, I don't hear as much being talked about as I made a game and it made like hundreds of thousands of pounds, which is a more common story. Um, so I'm going to tell a different one. So it's just a few points, basically, and then I'll do some questions. So the first point. The, the middle ground devs all ran off to mobile and left the door unlocked for us. Um, I don't know if you've been to the rest of Develop, but there's been a bit of a theme this year. Um, and it's monetization, it's mobile. Um, and that's cool, and there's a lot of people doing great work there. Um, I bloody love the room. Um, but there's also a lot of rubbish games. Um, what's interesting, though, and what makes this a, a cool thing for indie games is we're seeing all the people who are making film tie-in games, uh, double-A shooters, less than the triple-A's, all of those people are migrating to mobile or free-to-play, um, and we're seeing a big gap. There's nothing coming out on the consoles outside of November and December, and then February for the ones that kind of slipped and it didn't work out so well for. There's this massive gap that we can take advantage of. And indies, if you look historically, we've always done well from that. We, there's always been these gaps that really kind of work for us. So you see the first rise of the PC indie game. It coincided with digital distribution and everyone thinking console was the place to bring out your game. About five, six years ago, we have this massive space which everyone's just left. Indies do really well in these spaces because these spaces, when they become less fashionable, when they become the place where there's not the amazing growth at the moment, there's still players there, there's still people booting up their PCs, and we can do well, and I think Thomas benefited from where it was. It benefited from being a PC game. So that's, that's one point. We can do really well by avoiding the herd, essentially is my point. We could also do very, very well by joining the herd, but the odds are better, worse, because they're all there already. It's just one thing I think helped Thomas. Making cheap games has never been cheaper. Um, you hear a lot of stories about, um, you know, AAA development is getting really expensive. Really, really fucking expensive. That's the first time. I'm, I'm proud. Um, it's... <laughs> ooh. I really need to stop finding myself so funny. Um, <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, AAA games are getting more expensive. They're spending loads of money making, you know, beating each other on polygons or open worlds. But in the meantime, it's actually getting really, really cheap to make pretentious rectangle platformers. Um, and, and, and games like it, you know, indie games. Um, so Thomas, okay, so I get in trouble on Twitter when I talk about budgets. Um, all of my numbers disregard my wage. Um, because I do it for free, I don't, because, you know, roofs are great. Um, but the, uh, <laughs> I have to now lean away when I think I'm being funny. Aha, there we go. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so Thomas, excluding me, um, was about 5,000 pounds. Um, that was, that was uh, paying other people to do work, that was legal fees, platform fees, a bunch of, you know, going to events like this and telling people how clever I was and how they really should pick up that game I'm making. Um, and that was the kind of the budget that works. And I, I funded that primarily by kind of going out less and um, eating less takeaway food. 
uh, which I've now resumed, um, <laughs> and, 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 and I kind of just scrimped and saved. I also did a small crowd fund which covered my VO, which was lots of fun because I spent a month being told by every indie game developer, several are probably in this room, that you don't need VO and VO won't help your game sell. Cheers, guys. Um, <laughs> I'm glad I ignored you. Um, and then the new game is, um, which I'm not going to talk about today because it's not quite ready. Um, I reckon that one's going to come out at about about 25 to 30 thousand pounds in terms of the budget I'm spending in terms of the upfront costs. Obviously, people get percentages and royalties and all these kind of things as well. So it's not a really good indicator, but it's a big jump up. It's a much more expensive game. It's a much more ambitious game. But it's 30,000 pounds, which is nothing in the kind of big business sense. That would keep a pretty rubbish programmer in a job at a AAA for a year. Um, that's madness. Games are getting so cheap and my screen's gone off. Now hopefully this will come up without revealing my Unity files for my new game, let's see. Just type in my password. There we go. Hey, there we go. Power saving mode is awesome. Um, that's my point, is, is that's really cheap to make a humble game. To make a game that will release on desktop, maybe console, the ones that'll let me release on them. Um, to be on those con to be on those platforms for thirty thousand pounds is is amazing. Compared to three years ago, um, that's insane, and it's awesome. Next point. I can buy the solution to a common problem for less than an hour of a specialist freelancer's time. This is massive, and this is really recent. This is between six months and a year. So, uh, for those of you who don't use Unity, first off use Unity. Um, but the second point is um, the Unity Asset Store. So the Unity Asset Store, you go on there and you can buy art meshes, code, sound effects, everything really. Now, obviously, if you just bought all of your assets, you'd make a very generic game. Um, and you, it's not a good way to make games. But if you use it selectively, what you can do is you can source a lot of problems, uh, so, sorry, a lot of solutions uh, to, <laughs> to a lot of problems um, that, that you would normally have to pay a team. So a good example of this is my next game, um, uh, when a character moves behind a wall, I do the standard thing of making a silhouette where they are. So you can see where they are through the wall without it looking silly. Um, that, I've been on projects, which I won't name, where we decided not to add that because it would take too long for a programmer to get it in. Um, and for budget and time constraints, we decided to not to bother. I bought that for $20 off the Unity Asset Store. I get something, which like I say, that's less than I'd pay a freelancer for an hour by a long way, a good programmer. Um, but also the programmer who made it is not beholden to me to just buy it, sell it once. That, that person's probably selling that code over and over and over again, which changes the economics massively. In theory, if you can make an awesome little bit of code that everyone needs, and you sell it at a reasonable price, there are guys making a lot of money just doing that. And there are a lot of indies who are benefiting from it. And that changes a lot. Mixamo is another great example. I use a lot of motion capture data from them. I can have motion captured characters, and it costs me 100 quid. I don't know if you've ever asked a motion capture studio for a quote. It's, it's a bit more. Um, <laughs> and distribution platforms. So, so getting on distribution platforms, again, has eased up. It's gone into sleep mode again. I'm going to really know my password by the end of this. <laughs> um, so things like getting onto Steam. Steam integration. Anyone who tried to integrate themselves into Steam before a year ago knows that there's quite a lot of work to plug into the API. Leaderboards, achievements, those bloody cards they've just added. That's a lot of work. Um, you can buy code middleware on Unity Asset Store. When I bought it, it was $300. Now it's about 30. Um, <laughs> bastards. Um, <laughs> so you can, you can find these solutions. Jobs that used to be really expensive are now cheap. I've made that point a few times. I'm going to move on. Bosses are giving their employees freedom to do their own thing. Um, anyone who kind of follows me on Twitter or, or knows my background um, knows that I made Thomas while you know, working for other people. Um, and, then, and then quit my job. Sorry, Imre, I know you're in the room. Um, <laughs> I apologize. Um, but I'm going to say nice things about you now, so it's fine. Um, lots of employees are, are wising up to the fact that they have really um, individually creative people working for them. And that those people want to make stuff in their own time. They want to do cool things. They want to fiddle around, make little games. It keeps the employee happy. It trains them. And they might have success and then in front of a room full of people say you were clever to do that, which is good. 
it's, it's, we're seeing this everywhere. We're starting to see all these games coming from the ground up of companies. I'm gonna use Bosser as an example again because they just keep doing the right thing. Surgeon Sim was you know, a game jam by four guys. They brought it back into the office. Everyone in the office liked it. What did the company do? Did the company say, oh, that's really sweet. Now get back to work on that licensed game. No, they went, this is pretty cool. Um, and now they have a massive game, which is doing really successfully. Um, this is working. Like, there's a, there is a model where you don't have the boss of a company decides necessarily what everyone's doing. Um, and companies are changing. And that's only a good thing for the kind of people who would come to an event like this and listen to an indie prattle on about how clever they are. Players age, they diversified, they broadened. This one's going to get some booze. Um, <laughs> so, so obviously, that's what everyone's saying because it's it's true. I mean, it, it's it's always true. It's it's never been a case where everyone just sat down and said, "No, I'm, everyone who's playing a game at the start of the year, that's going to be our audience at the end of the year. No new gamers this year." That's never happened. However, um, we have diversified. More people are playing games than ever, etc., etc., etc. What that doesn't mean is all those players want casual games. Um, you can actually, what's, what's a brilliant side effect for our business model, for those of us making games for less than 50,000 pounds plus our own time, which also carries a cost, um, we can actually make a really niche game. Because there's so many players, that means that if 0.1% of them kind of want a farmyard, but I was about to say a farmyard simulator, I think that one's more popular as a genre. Um, I'll pick another example. No, if you want something really weird and esoteric, chances are, an indie's working on it. And an indie can actually make a game that will actually find an audience. The net is so large now that there's actually a, a business case for making something weird and niche and actually still doing well business-wise. The AAA guys are all focusing in. They've got their audience, these kind of teenage boys who like shooting stuff. They're, they're focusing in and they're competing with each other in order to own that audience. Fine we're going to target the people who want games about people with strange hats or, or time travelers uh, who are rectangles or whatever we want to make, whatever weird game we want to make, there's probably 30 to 40,000 people who'd buy it. And we can live off that, we can do all right. And also one more point, story. Turns out story's a big deal for a lot of players. A lot of people like a cool story and we often underestimate that. Um, from a kind of uh, moving on the, uh, the medium standard point, I kind of, I totally get that we want to let do player stories and focus on that stuff. But actually, as well as that, we can also do focused, drilled in stories like mine. Basically, that's, that's where I say I'm clever. Next point. Curators are more important than broadcasters. Um, so, so again, it changed. The power and where the power to kind of get the word out about your game was, has shifted. Um, we have celebrities now in the indie world, you know, the, the, the big names, obviously, people like Notch, um, who exist and play games, and if they like something, they'll tweet about it or they'll mention it in an interview, and that can have a massive effect, um, more so than being on the front page of a major gaming website, and that's a big deal because that changes the relationships. A lot of indies who choose to be kind of public, and not, it's not for everyone, but a lot of people who kind of go out there and talk about their own work and also talk about the work being done by everyone else, those people um, are, are finding an audience who use them as a way of finding out about cool stuff. Um, this is awesome. Those indies who do it love it because it gives them a chance to give back and, and, and you look clever if you're the guy who finds the cool new game, um, which really appeals to a lot of indies. But but that means that that changes the power dynamic. It, ch it means that games that are weird and cool become popular because it doesn't have to appeal to a common denominator. Um, people are just choosing stuff they like, and that's awesome. And there is this whole circle of life thing that the indies want to kind of pull up as many other indies as they can. And the broadcast has changed. Let's players are fucking awesome. Um, <laughs> I run a bit 